Good morning. I may be the only person here who cannot speak any French. So <laughs> it's good to be here. Who woke up this morning very happy to be in Evia? Put up two hands if you are happy also to not be on Zoom. <laughs> it's great to be in a room with so many people. Yet yeah, last week I did my first talk in a room with people in since March last year, and this week is my second. So I am just very excited to be back with people, and I'm so happy that you're all here. So who here is ready to be brave? Who's too scared to put up their hand? Aha. Uh -huh. The last 18, 19 months have forced all of us out of our comfort zone. Whether you wanted to go outside your comfort zone or not, you found yourself out there. And yet, I have found over my life that we don't grow when we're comfortable. We don't grow when everything is going just the way we want it to be. We don't grow when all of our plans go perfectly. Whose plans have gone upside down in the last 18 months? Aha, uh -huh, me too, me too. In fact, in March last year, I was living in Singapore, and I had one child in Singapore, and I had three children living in the United States. And my husband flew into Singapore from New York, where COVID-19 was starting to spread pretty rapidly. And he landed in Singapore, and unbeknownst to us, within a day or two, he was feeling unwell. He had COVID. And I said, maybe you should go off and get a test, because maybe it sounds like COVID. You've got a fever, a cough. He walked into a hospital in Singapore, and the, uh, the alarm started going off. And people came out and grabbed him and took him off to a room. And he didn't come out for 30 days. He's okay, he has made a full recovery. But of course, I went into immediate quarantine with my son. But my children on the other side of the world in the United States, two of them, their schools closed, they had nowhere to live. And my husband was in the hospital and I, I was in quarantine. And the funny, slightly funny thing was, I had just released my fifth book called You've Got This. And I was supposed to have been going off to America to do a book tour. Instead, I found myself locked in my apartment, <laughs> the government calling me three times a day to check that I was there, my husband in hospital, two children kind of homeless in America, and I had to keep looking at my book title going, you've got this, you've got this, you've got this. So I know what it's like to have plans turn upside down. And it's why today I'm so happy to be talking to you about how you can lead with more courage, because right now, as we're coming out of this pandemic, slowly, 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 this is a time for us to be more daring. Because there are always opportunities that are born from disruption. And in the midst of uncertainty, there's always lots of new possibilities. But we have to be bold. We have to take risks. We have to embrace uncertainty not as something that happens every now and again, but just as a norm. So I grew up in Australia, as Christine just shared. I grew up actually the big sister of seven children. And uh, when I was about 10, my father, um, I said to my father, oh, I would really love to get a, a pony for my birthday. And there was a lot of drought. My father milked cows for 50 years to raise his family. And there was, there was a drought and there wasn't a lot of money. And my father sold a pig to buy an old horse. And I would go out there, I got him on my 10th birthday, and I would go out every morning and every afternoon and I would learn to try and bridle him up and saddle him up. And over the course of about 12 months, I got kind of good at riding this horse, but he was really slow. So I said, could I please get a faster horse? Again, there wasn't much money. So my father went into a raffle and he bought $1 worth of tickets and at the end of uh, the raffle I was praying, did God please let us win this horse? We won my second horse. This horse was from Australia's snowy mountains and he went from zero to 100 miles an hour in about three seconds. So I had to dial up my courage all over again. 
But what I learned over the course of learning to ride horses was that growth and comfort can't ride the same horse. And if you only do what's comfortable, you will never know what's possible for you. And if you don't embrace discomfort as a prerequisite for your own growth and to fulfill your own potential, not only will you never know what you can do, what you can achieve personally, but the whole world will be worse off. Certainly your organization will be worse off. Your family, those you love you will be worse off. Because for you to grow into your potential, to really unleash your potential, you have to often do the very things that scare you. Fear holds potential hostage. There's been a lot of fear in the last 12, 18 months. In fact, the fear that you have you felt, maybe you don't say fear, maybe it's been anxiety. Who says they have felt feared about over the last 18 months? Has felt a lot more fear than usual. Certainly there's been a lot of anxiety, a lot of uncertainty. And so that uncertainty has only made people more risk averse. It's actually magnified our sensitivity to risk and has driven many people to want to play it even more safe. And so what I'm going to share with you is a framework for how you can be braver. Three things that you, and when you are at your most powerful, when you are at your greatest potential, it's at the intersection of these three things. Firstly, what is your focus? What you focus on expands. And our focus is both our intention, what our purpose is, but also our attention. Intention, attention. So we're going to be breaking this down in, a little, in, in just a moment's time, but what are you putting your focus on? And so often we focus on what we don't want, we focus on what we hope won't happen, we focus on what we can't do, we focus on the resources we don't have, what's outside our control. And you know, women, how often when I have been coaching a woman, she maybe gets offered an opportunity, she starts arguing for all the reasons why she can't do it. Oh, I haven't got enough experience. Oh, I'm not ready yet. Oh, I need to be more confident. Oh, I... And often we focus on the negative versus focusing on, well, what can you do? How can you step in and take on that role? What could you learn? And so I want you, and obviously gentlemen in the room too, think about what are you putting your focus on? <coughs> Secondly, our mindset. And in particular, the stories that we often tell ourselves about the world, about our organizations. And yes, Christine and Anne were just talking about how women, we can create our own glass cage. There are absolutely barriers that keep women from moving up, systemic barriers at the macro level. But we can be our own barrier in our own thinking, in our own heads. We can get in our own way. And so I'm going to be challenging you, and also in my workshop that you'll be joining, I'm going to get you to challenge some of the beliefs that you tell yourself, maybe very habitual ways of processing and interpreting the world, or maybe things that you say about yourself to yourself. I'm not smart enough. I'm not capable enough. No one ever listens to me. I, I can't do this. I, and we often hold ourselves back before the world ever gets in our way. And so we're going to talk about your mindset. And thirdly, action. There is no shortcut to courage. Action is the only true antidote to fear. And yet, we are wired not to do those brave things that we have the ability to do. We are wired to play it safe. So there has been a lot of research about the behavioral traits of great leaders. Research has found that women possess in abundance the key behavioral traits for great leadership, particularly during times of change and crises. 
Women score incredibly high on empathy, on authenticity, and on humility. All the traits that we need in this new era. We're in a new era now. We need a new style of leadership. The old authoritarian command and control style of leadership is no longer effective. And courage is the force multiplier. And let me just define courage for you. Courage is not the absence of fear and self-doubt and little voices in your head that go, who do you think you are to do that? Does anyone have a voice like that in their head? It is action in the presence of those voices. Someone asked me last night at dinner, well, you talk about courage, have you been brave? And I said, yes, all the time. I have voices in my head saying, don't do that. As I was sitting here before, I was like, ah. <laughs> but I have become better at saying, thank you very much, shut up, and then doing it anyway. <laughs> Taking action in the presence of fear. And so for you, recognizing that courage, it's like a muscle, who goes to the gym regularly? Few of you, yeah. <laughs> if you haven't been to the gym for a long time and you lift weights, you'll lift some very little weights and you'll go, oh, oh, you're sore all over. But if you go back and you go day after day after day, you get stronger. And the things that were once difficult become easy. And so for me with riding horses, in the beginning it was so scary and so hard and after a year it was like, I need something bigger, I need a faster horse. It's the same for you. Who can look back at the start of your career and think of something you had to do and you were terrified having to do it? Maybe give a sales presentation, maybe you know, lead a project, and now you look at it and you go, ah, oh, it's nothing. It's because the more we do the things that are uncomfortable, the less uncomfortable they become. So where does this begin? It begins with you leading yourself first. Your ability to lead others is directly proportional to your ability to lead yourself. All great leadership extends from the inside out. And I can tell very quickly how great a leader will be depending on how much they reflect and how introspective they are, how much they think about what's going on and where they're getting in their own way. Where are they operating from ego? or insecurity or fear. And so one of the key things is grounding yourself in what I call self-certainty. So last year when my husband went off and he was in hospital and in the beginning we didn't know how serious it was. We thought it was in his lungs. They thought it was in his lungs at the hospital. And I had three children on the other side of the world. It was two of them were like upset and anxious because they suddenly didn't have a home and Singapore closed its borders and it was a difficult, challenging time. And for a couple of days there, I felt really overwhelmed. Have you ever felt really overwhelmed? I felt really overwhelmed. And there I was, I had my book, You've Got This. I'm like, yes, I've got this, I've got this, I've got this, I've got this. <laughs> and I would sit down and I would just breathe really deeply. And I would put my hand on wherever I was feeling tight. Right now, I want you just to notice your body. Notice if you've got any anxiety in your body, anything that's feeling a little bit tight, and I want you to put your hand on that place. Maybe it's your heart, your stomach. And I want you to close your eyes just for a moment, and I want you to take a really deep breath and breathe in to wherever you might be feeling a little bit tight or anxious. And I want you to breathe in courage and breathe out fear. And just ground yourself. Feel the floor beneath you, the beautiful wooden, the wood beneath your feet. And ground yourself in the certainty that you have everything that is required to meet the challenges that you will face. Take another big breath, the deepest breath you have all day. And then breathe out that fear. Okay. Lily Tomlin, a comedian, once said, I always wanted to be somebody. I should have been more specific. 
A study at Stanford University found that when people were taken, there was a group, they took them aside, and before they went into a negotiation, they primed them with what they called attitude certainty. They connected them to the attributes that they wanted to embody when they went into a negotiation. They wanted to be confident. They wanted to be focused. They reminded them of the times they'd been successful before. They connected to their strengths. And so they went in there very grounded in self-certainty, in attitude certainty. And those people negotiated outcomes, on average, 40% better than those who just went in and didn't do that priming. And so for you, when it comes to you leading others, when it comes to you showing up and being the brave leader that you want to be, the man, the woman that you want to be, start with deciding who do I want to be as a leader? Who do I want to be as a human being? Power has no gender. It is not male and it is not female. But our mental template of power often looks like a man dressed in a suit. The fact is you have the ability to be powerful. Power comes from inside you. And it starts by deciding how do you want to show up? Leaders are like emotional barometers, like thermostats. People look to you for, for cues on how should I react. And in the midst of difficult times, they, they need you to show up with certainty. Last year, when everything was turning upside down, everyone knew the people in charge did not have control. They didn't really know what was going on. They had no more certainty than anyone else. But when you know that someone may not be able to control their circumstances, but they at least are in control of themselves, it reassures people. So for you to decide, who do you want to be? And then from that place, decide what do you need to do? And that will help you create and achieve what you want to have. So I just want you to think about what are the attributes that define the leader that you want to be? Brave, perhaps, courageous, focused, purposeful, empathetic, humble, open, encouraging, approachable, disciplined, agile. I want you to think of three or four traits that really, that really describe how you want to show up as a leader over the next 12 months. And there may be things that you need to practice. If you're already super disciplined, you don't need to say that. If you're already incredibly assertive, you don't need to say that. But if you sometimes hold back and you're a bit timid, maybe you need to say, I want to be more assertive. I want you just to really identify who do you want to be as a leader. And from that place, I want you to think about what is it that you want to achieve? What's the vision that you have for yourself moving forward? So who here has an idea of what they'd like to be doing in five years' time? About 10 hands. Having a vision acts like a compass. When you have an idea of where you want to go, you go, well, I need to spend more time doing this and less time doing this. Great leaders are really excellent at getting other people to rally behind a vision of the future and to really connect with a purpose, something that's bigger than themselves. You have to be clear about why, what it is you want to do matters. You have to be able to answer the question, for the sake of what am I willing to be brave? Because you know what? Unless you have the clarity of purpose, why on earth would you bother to stick your neck out? Why would you have a difficult conversation? Why would you hike, climb up the mountain? Why would you get out of bed early and go to work and put in extra hours? Why would you go and, and put your hand up and volunteer to lead a team because maybe you'll get greater visibility, maybe it'll expand your network? Women, we often need to be a bit more ambitious than we are. And often, 
our fear of not having what it takes stops us from daring to say, I really want to do that. I really want to, that's what inspires me. It's to go and to, to run a division or to whatever it is that inspires you. We're all inspired by different things, thank goodness. When I, uh, in 2001, exactly 20 years ago, in fact, next week on October the 7th, uh, I had a three-year-old, a two-year-old, and an eight-week-old baby. And my husband and I moved to the United States from Australia. It was just after 9-11. It was a difficult time. And about six months later, I was, I was, I went and I did this visualization exercise. Like, what is the future that I want to create for myself? And I remember in my head, in my, med, in my mind's eye, popped into my head four children. And I already had three, and I was super stretched. I was like, how on earth can I ever have four children <laughs> and have a career? Because I wanted to kind of start a career in a whole new area. I'd gone back to university and studied psychology. I had started my career in, in business, in marketing. And I remember just being terrified. How do I do that? How can I possibly do that? But I was inspired by the idea of at least allowing the possibility to have four children. And I had had multiple miscarriages. I know that you might say, oh, yes, it's, it's great to say you want to have a children. There's obviously what you can want to do, and then there's the reality. But I was inspired by that. And it helped me get clarity about, OK, I have to do things differently. But I also want to write a book, and I also want to start a business in a new country, and I want to. And there was all these things I wanted to do. But I had to be clear about why do I want to do it. And being raised in a big family, I, my parents were Catholic, Margaret Mary. And they always said, you should always try and live your life for others. So there was never a lot of money in our family, but you should always, to he who much is given, much is expected. To she who much is given, much is expected. And so for me, I'm very passionate, as Christine said, in my work, but also I wanted to have this family. And so I got challenged by how do I do that? And so it was... It was scary sometimes because straight away was the little stories, I don't have what it takes. I don't know if I can do it. But it was that willingness to take action. And for you each to decide what does success look like for you? What is your vision of success? And not other people's visions of success. This photo here I found a few years ago because when I was about 12, my father said to me one day, Margaret Mary, I see great things for you. And I was like, oh, you do, Dad? <laughs> and I was thinking, Princess Diana. <laughs> yes, that sounds good. And though it didn't go so well. <laughs> Margaret Thatcher, yes, yes, I could be a prime minister maybe, uh, except for her hair, maybe not that. <sighs> Meryl Streep, oh my gosh, I can be dramatic. And he said, Margaret Mary, you're so capable. I see you being Sister Margaret Mary, <laughs> running a convent. Oh. He could see that my shoulders drooped, and he said, actually, no, 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 no. He said, I see you being Mother Margaret Mary, running a whole order of convents. Let's just say I never felt the calling. But growing up on a farm about four hours from Melbourne, my own vision of what was possible extended little further than our back fence. And because my parents were very rural farming people, they didn't, they, no one had gone to college, to university. So they, 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 my father thought that was a wonderful thing for me to do. But sometimes we buy into other people's beliefs about what we can do and what we can't do. Sometimes we let other people's ambitions for us cloud our own or stymie and limit our own. Sometimes we let other people's limited vision get in the way of our vision. And let's face it, ladies, women, we are, we are parented often differently. Even those of us who may be, even I have one daughter and three sons, and I'm all about women's empowerment, but my daughter sometimes points out, mum, how come you ask me to empty the dishwasher and you ask the boys to take the rubbish out? I was like, oh, good point, you take the rubbish out. And then she's like, no, 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 I'll empty the dishwasher. <laughs> but just recognizing that there are gender norms 
and gender norms can get conditioned into us very early. What's normal for a woman versus what's normal for a man. Parents of sons are far more likely to encourage them to go into technology, are far more likely to encourage them to do those more masculine careers than parents of daughters. And we know, obviously, you look at women in STEM, in science, technology, engineering, maths, far fewer women, and often it's part of it's because they don't even have the role models, they don't see themselves doing it. And so for us right now, for all of you, you have to be breaking down the norms. We cannot change norms if all we do is conform to norms. So I live now just, just across the river from Washington, DC. So I live in a little place called Old Town Alexandria. And George Washington spent his childhood there and he lived there and he died right near where I lived. And he stood at a place a little, about one kilometer from my house and he said, I, and he created a vision of Washington DC, this, this area that would be 10 miles, 10 miles square. And I walk past it often, many times during a, a week when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm home. And it amazes me to think that, ah, he stood there and create, created that. Obviously, everything great that's ever been created anywhere starts with a vision of someone thinking about a future that is different than the one that is the default future. And so for you, when you think about where you're going, are you inspired by it or are you just going through the motions in autopilot? Leaders listen from the level of what is. This is where things are right now. We are, this is, the, this is our sales numbers, this is the forecast, this is how many employees we have, this is what the vaccination rates are, this is what the economy is doing. Leaders need to listen within their teams and organisations from the level of what is. They need to manage what the forecasts are, what they think is coming, what's probable. Next year, growth looks like being this much. Next year, this is what we think is going to happen. But leaders lead from the level of possibility. What could be possible? There is incredible opportunities to reinvent the way we work and live and lead coming out of this pandemic. Every great crisis in history has been followed by a blossoming social, cultural, economic. We're, you're, you're here in this room at an amazing point in history. Really, the opportunity is so rich, but it requires you to step up and go, what do I want to create for myself, but more so in my team, in my organization, in my community, in the world? and to lead from a place of possibility. Right now, I'd like you to cross your arms. Okay, and look at the person next to you crossing their arms. Okay, now I want you to uncross your arms, and I want you to recross them the opposite way. Christine and Elizabeth told me you were clever, but I see people can't even figure out what you're doing. Okay, so this is how you might have your default way of crossing your arms. You don't really think about it, you just cross your arms, you just probably cross your legs often the same way, but legs are a little easier. And I just asked you to cross your arms your undefault way. And some of you were like, couldn't figure it out. And I get you to do that because what you often don't realize is how much you do things in a default habitual mode. You have habitual ways of doing things. You go into autopilot. And autopilot's fine. How you cross your arms is just fine. But where are you operating in autopilot? In how you show up every day, in how you communicate, in how you interact. And where are you in just autopilot with your future? It's just in default mode versus this is what would inspire me, this is what would excite me. Imagine if we created a program called Program Eve and we brought everyone to Evian and we gave them an amazing three-day live-in experience in a beautiful place. Someone had to come up with that idea before you all came here. 
Nothing exists but first in the imagination. And I want you to think about where do I need to be more bold and more daring in what I create? A few years ago, my husband was having a milestone birthday. And I said to him, what would you like to do for your birthday? And he said, I reckon it'd be really cool to go to Africa and do a safari. And one of my children, Ben, said, yeah, yeah, safari sounds great, but wouldn't it be even more cool if we climb Mount Kilimanjaro? And we were living at sea level in Melbourne at the time, and uh, we didn't go hiking as a family. We didn't live in a place like this with the beautiful Alps. There weren't any mountains around. But my son put together a PowerPoint presentation about why our family should climb to the rooftop of Africa to celebrate Dad's 50th birthday. And by the end of it, I was like, yes, let's do it. And then had to go about organizing it. And we flew to Tanzania. Does anyone here climb Kilimanjaro? Probably a few. Oh, yes, a few. Well, I'm sure you did it faster than we did. So off we went to Africa and we climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. And on summit day, which is the most grueling day, for some people it takes them four or five hours to get from base camp to the top. It took us nine hours. And I was, nearly all of us were throwing up and our, my heart was beating out of my chest and my head was pounding. And there were many times one or several of us wanted to just give up. But we kept saying, come on, you can do it, you can do it. And we would say, let's keep going. We had guides with us and we were checking our oxygen levels because I know it can be dangerous. But after nine hours, we got to the top of Kilimanjaro. And this photo, it's the only time that we smiled all day. <laughs> <laughs> There was no guarantee that we would make it. At the time, my children were 13, 14, 17, and 18. Many people don't, not only because it just, they get tired, but because actually they're unwell and they have to go down. But because we were inspired by an invented future that our family would all climb to the rooftop of Africa, we all pulled each other up emotionally. Let's do it. And we dug deep and we accessed tenacity and grit and determination and perseverance. And we managed to do something that frankly was pretty bold. It was an audacious ambition. And I didn't realize how audacious, how bold that ambition was until we got there and I realized, oh my gosh, this is really hard. But we were there, and we just one foot slowly, slowly, pole, pole. For those of you who know Swahili, pole, pole. Slowly we made it to the top. You have no idea what you are capable of doing unless you dare to do something that is bigger and bolder than what you have done before. So I encourage you to set goals that exceed your current capacity, to try to do things that aren't easy and that will require you sometimes to have to just put one foot in front of the other and risk falling short. This is a photo of me when I had four little children in Dallas, Dallas, Texas. Do we have any Americans here besides a couple? Yes, God bless your heart. Um, so, <clears throat> I can say that and I know you, you're not offended, but uh, a lot of people blessed my heart when I got to Texas. God bless your heart. I just wanted someone to say, come and drink a bottle of wine. I'm sure that would have happened had I moved to France. Um, but when I connected with that vision of, oh, I would love to have four children, but I was also starting a new career path, how can I do that? Straight away, I had a story of, you can't have... I had, you can't have four children and have a career. You just, that was a belief that was holding me back. And a friend of mine, a woman, said to me, Margie, that's just complete and utter BS. She said, you just have to do it differently. And so I needed to get more help because I didn't have hardly any help. I had this thing that I had to do it all myself. I had to do it the hard way because that's how my mother did it. 
and I got an au pair, and oh my goodness, it changed my life. It was wonderful. And so for you, I, I encourage you to think about where are you living in a story? I say a story about what you think you can do or what you can't do, about what you don't have, about what's possible or not possible that is holding you back. You might see one woman at this table. Her name is Catherine Graham. And she was the first ever CEO of a Fortune 500 company in America. And she became the CEO because her husband died. And he was the CEO of the company that her father had given to her husband. Because, of course, you would never give it to a daughter. Because women don't want to be involved in business. She should just go to the tea parties. But her husband died, and she stepped in and took over the reins of this business. And in the beginning, she lacked confidence. Whenever she had a decision to make, she would consult everybody else. She really lacked belief in her own ability to make good decisions. But over time, she came to see that she was every bit as capable, if not more capable, than the men sitting around her board table. And look how many there were. There's something I used to believe, and that's that we cannot be what we cannot see. It's true, role models make a massive difference to our ability to see ourselves being successful. I did not have pretty much any role models growing up myself. However, I no longer believe that. I think we can be what we cannot see. But we have to believe very deeply and that takes courage. We have to rise above the doubts and the fears and the little voices in our head that say, you don't have what it takes. You can't do that. I mean, what do you know? Who sometimes wrestles with those voices in your head? So I want you to think about what's another story you could tell yourself that makes you feel more powerful more purposeful and more positive. Because the stories we tell ourselves, those beliefs that we sometimes they're like playing on repeat in our heads, they can hem us in. Your stories either expand what's possible for you or they shrink it. You create your stories and then your stories create you. When I was 21, I went backpacking around the world for a year. And at the end of my backpacking trip, I was in Thailand, and my brother, Frank, came to meet me. And we stayed in a little village, and we did like four days hiking in this jungle in the north of Thailand, near Chiang Mai, for those who've been there. And I noticed that the elephants didn't leave the village, and I said, how come the elephants don't go out of the village? And the guide said, oh, well, when they're born, they're about one ton at birth, they were about 10 foot they put an anklet around their ankle and tie it with a rope or a chain to a little tree or a stake in the middle of the village. And the baby elephants go to wander off and then they realize that they can't because they've been tethered. And after a while, they stop trying. And between the ages of two and three, they take away the rope. And the elephants are now three to four ton, 14 foot high, but they no longer try to leave because they have been conditioned to believe it's just not possible. And I remember thinking at the time, how silly are the elephants? But how often do we as human beings fall into the trap of treating an opinion as though it's the truth, to buying into other people's ideas, norms, rules, standards, expectations and treating them as though they're the truth. Like, you just can't do that. Who says you can't? Who says you can't? Remember many years ago, but before 1956, I believe, we believed that a human being couldn't run a mile in under four minutes. The greatest physiologist at the time said it's just not possible. The human body cannot run that fast. The body is just not made to do it. 
And then a guy, Roger Bannister, a Brit, he ran a mile in three minutes, 59.6 seconds. Amazing. It was on the newspapers all around the world. But you know what's more amazing? Within two weeks, an Australian <laughs> took off about 0.3 of a second. Wow, it's never been done in history, and suddenly it's done twice in two weeks. And then in the following two years, it was done about seven times until it was about three minutes, 58.9 seconds. And of course, today, with some drugs, you can do it in about 20 seconds. <laughs> So I encourage you to challenge what you think is possible. Challenge the stories. And when you find yourself feeling stressed or anxious, or you're like, <gasps> ask yourself, what's another story I could tell? And then finally, the third part of the intersection of the pillar for you to really unleash your potential and to make your biggest mark is to do the very things that scare you more often. Now, not necessarily something really big, but in, even in small ways. Courage is a muscle, remember. It's a skill. You can learn it. And if, here's the other side of the coin. Often we go, oh, I don't want to do that. You know, not for me. It's like muscles. If you don't go to the gym, they don't stay the same. They atrophy. They get smaller. People who live their lives in their comfort zones don't stay as confident as they were. They lose confidence. If you're not continually challenging and stretching yourself, you won't stay the same level of self-belief. It will wane over time. So where do you need to stretch yourself a little more? And where do you need to rethink risk? Because, as I said, this pandemic has only magnified our sensitivity to risk, only made us more conscious of all the things that could go wrong. And yet, the biggest risk you can take is not taking a risk at all. So let me just share with you a little neuroscience. Any neuroscientists in the room? No, good, I can make this up then. I'm not one either. No, but our brains, your brains, you're not wired to be happy, you're wired to be safe. So our brains are wired to overestimate risk. They're wired to focus on all the things that can go wrong, on what we might lose. Losses, potential losses loom larger in our heads than potential gains. And so when you think about having that difficult conversation or you think about trying something new, putting your hand up for a job, going out and, 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 and putting yourself out there, whatever out there is, you're straight away going to go to, oh, yeah, but this could go wrong and that could go wrong. And what if I fail? When my first book was coming out, uh, it was uh, coming out around the world, actually, with McGraw-Hill. And it was, had been me being brave writing a book because in my head, the little voice was like, who do you think you are to write a book? You know, I haven't studied writing. I went to a small little school. Um, and I had a lot of reasons why not. And I remember saying to my husband, you know, I mean, I don't have all the answers to all the problems in the universe. And, you know, I know I'm not like a J.K. Rowling. You know, I'm not like, I don't feel like I'm some literary genius. And my husband said, well, honey, what you have to say is helpful to people. So why don't you just write the best book you can right now? And when you're old and wise and have all the answers to all the problems in the universe, you can write another book. <laughs> and with that, I gave myself permission to write my first book, to lower the bar and stop focusing on what I didn't have and what I couldn't do and just get on with focusing on what I did have and what I could do. We also tend to catastrophize outcomes. And in the lead up to that book coming out, I remember waking up in the middle of the night one night and in my mind's eye was the New York Times and it was the front page and it was just a great big picture of me and it just said, world's worst author. <laughs> that would have been good publicity. Let's face it, that was never going to happen. Sometimes, particularly when there's a lot of uncertainty, we turn our forecasts into fear casts and we catastrophize. We also tend to underestimate ourselves and ladies, we do that so much more than men. 
I'm sure you're aware of the study Hewlett Packard did where they were looking at why do we have, we, we, we recruit all these women at the ground level, but we have so few women at the top. Why is that? And they did an internal study of their internal job openings, and they found that men would apply for the jobs if they had six of the 10 criteria on average. Women wouldn't apply unless they could tick 10 out of 10 boxes with big fat ticks too. And it's been my experience that we often focus on what we don't have and we underestimate what we're capable of. Women tend to also make fewer reckless decisions. That's why we need diversity in teams. We need diversity of personalities, of genders, of gender. We need all types of diversity. But often we sell ourselves short. We undervalue our strengths. We talk ourselves down. We also tend to discount the cost of inaction. The fact is that the risks that you don't take, the consequences are very rarely immediate, very rarely obvious, and very rarely dramatic. You don't know what you missed out on when you decided not to say anything, when you decided not to put your hand up, not to go and pursue something that excited you. You don't know what you missed out on, but never underestimate the hidden tax of playing it safe. Because while we like to shore up our short-term sense of security and comfort, and we go, I'm not going to do that, it's too risky, it's too uncomfortable, it gives us this illusion of security. But when all we do is play it safe and avoid risk, and stick with what's comfortable and what's familiar and the known and the status quo, actually, down the track, we pay a steep hidden cost. It's why organizations that don't adapt to change can get left behind. Think of Kodak, 35 millimeter film. Ah, oh, people aren't gonna wanna use these phones in their, cam in their cameras in their phones. Be careful of buying into beliefs about how things are going to be in the future. Challenge your own assumptions about what can be done and what can't be done. Continually unlearn what you think you know so you can relearn what you need to know. And be very, very careful in thinking that taking the safest course is actually the smartest course. And finally, we tend to protect the status quo. There is a strong gravitational pull on the status quo. Great leaders, brave leaders, resist the gravitational pull of the status quo. They forge new ground even when it's uncertain. They make decisions even when they don't have all the information they would like. They take action even though there's a risk that those actions may fall short of the outcome that they want. Jeff Bezos from Amazon says he makes decisions based on 70% of the available information. That means it's guaranteed that some of the things he does won't get great outcomes because he only had 70% of the available information. But the culture there is continually about innovating, iterating, experimenting. Let's try this and then adjust as we go along. What would you do if you gave yourself permission not to do things perfectly? What would you do if you gave yourself permission to make less than perfect decisions? And as women, we tend to fall victim to perfectionist standards. We think we have to do things brilliantly. We think we have to know everything. We think we have to be masterful. Leonardo da Vinci-like brilliance before we start out and step out and speak up and step up to the plate. I can't tell you how many times I've spoken to women who say, oh, I'm not a leader. Now, I mean, I'm not super charismatic like that. 
because their idea of what leadership is, as I said, often is male, comes dressed in a suit and has all sorts of charisma, but that's not how it always is. And as you know, for you to be a leader, it's about you being 100% who you are. The world doesn't need women to be more like men. We, we have enough men. And that's no offence to men. I'm married to one. I'm raising three of them. Men are wonderful. And we can do so much more when we're collaborating, when we're equal partners on a level field. The question is, where do you need to be braver and stepping up? And part of that is in speaking up, in having brave conversations. No one conversation is guaranteed to change the trajectory of your career or your business or your life, but any single conversation can. We live in conversations. Your relationships are built in conversations. Here, over the next few days, the conversations you have can open new doors of opportunity, of possibility, can build relationships, can grow your currency of trust. But be careful that you don't get pulled into the habit of many women where you talk yourself down, where you undersell your strengths, where you apologize for having an opinion that might differ from somebody else's opinion, where you might minimize. And rather, I encourage you to stand tall, walk tall, sit tall in your innate worth, in the value that you bring. Because when you own your value, you magnify that value. Every single one of you have experiences that no one else has ever had. Every one of you have a unique combination of experiences and strengths and skills and passion and personality and opportunity and access to resources that no one else has. And when all you do is sit back and go, oh, I don't want to rock the boat and I, I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings or ruffle feathers and I'm not sure if people will like what I have to say, you deprive everybody of the value that you have to bring. So when it comes to training the brave, I encourage you, exit your conversational comfort zone. Go up and introduce yourself to people that you've never met. And when you get back to work, every day ask yourself, what's a conversation I need to have today? Where do I need to make a brave ask? Where do I need to say no or set a boundary and risk disappointing someone? Where do I need to give feedback? Where do I need to ask for feedback? Where do I need to advocate for myself? I've been running programs, uh, retreats myself over the last few years called Live Brave Weekends, and I can't tell you how many times women have gone from those, and here I hope all of you, men and women, will go back and make a brave ask. Let someone know, this is what I'd love to do. Because how can people help you get what you want if they don't know what you want? Reframe your nerves, and ultimately, the finally, make sure you amplify the voice of other women. We grow stronger lifting weights, but we grow more powerful lifting each other. And we need more women lifting more women, and we need more men amplifying the voice of other women. So, in finishing, your power lays at the intersection of what you're focused on, what you're telling yourself about what you're focused on, and the actions you're taking. So ask yourself, whenever you find yourself feeling less than powerful, what is it I'm focusing on? Where do I need to shift my focus? What's another story I could tell myself here? And where do I need to embrace discomfort and dare to do the very thing that scares me? 
Your desire for safety and for comfort will always be in a tug of war with your desire for growth, for learning, for contribution. Be the leader that the world needs you to be right now. Be authentic, be humble, be empathetic, but most of all, be really brave because the world does not need your perfection. It needs your courage. Thank you. Thank you.